Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Alan. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. And uh, in the tradition of the meeting, I my sobriety date is June 23rd, 1986. Um, I was 25 when I got sober. Um, you can do the math um, if you want to know how old I am. Um, I was at a meeting the other day, and the and the chairperson, you know, stood up, sat up there, and he's got he had you know six or seven years, and he said, you know, after all this time, he says, I'm just not nervous anymore. And a and friend of mine leaned over this because that's sort of like because you're a sociopath, <laughs> uh, you know, and. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and um, I still get nervous, and I think that's a that's a good sign. Um, so let's see. The big book says um, we share in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. Everybody always says it's what it's like, what happened, what it's like now. There was no it. It was what I was like. What I was like before I got to AA, um, going way back, and I, and I really appreciated your share because I, I really identified with a lot of things. Um, you know, home life was hard when I was a kid. I can't tell you that, you know, any one certain thing happened. I just knew that um, I developed early on a distorted view of the world. And um, I didn't have any tools to deal with that view of the world. So um, I read a lot. Um, I had a I had a little room. Finally, when I got my own room, it was like this cinder block, 10 by 10 thing that I was in, you know, and I would lock my, not lock myself, but I would hide in that room for hours and hours at a time and um, read. And so I learned to live my life vicariously through these fantasies that I would read. Um, and when I came out of that room, I was ill-equipped. Um, to deal with things. And so um, I was always looking for approval, you know, is one, one way to put it. And when I, on my, on my 16th birthday, um, my brother said, here, try this. I'm not going to, I won't say what it was, but he said, here, try this. And I said, okay. And I tried it. And I remember but what I took away from that was I went to my friends and said, I did this. And they all said, ooh, that's really cool. And I got this feedback, which was, you do this, you get good feedback. And so I started to do that. And um, feedback sort of died off, but I was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I kept doing the, these things. And the funny thing was is that in, in my early life, um, my dad was a drinker. And when he drank, his personality changed. And when his personality changed, I went into my room if I could, because it was not a pleasant experience. And I can remember in my early teens swearing. I mean, I didn't believe in the Bible or anything, but I, I, would, I swore, I am never going to drink because I don't ever want to be like that. And um, I thought that I'd actually sort of held firm to that um, that vow for a long time until my sisters um, a couple of years ago brought out a, uh, a photo album called The 70s. Um, <laughs> and there were pictures of me in, in really bad clothes, um, really bad glasses, and with a beer in my hand. And I have no memory of that. I have no memory of the fact that I was drinking back in the, at that time. But I was probably doing it so that I could fit in with the crowd that I was with. Um, I grew up in Alaska, um, which is means nothing other than um, drinking is sort of like the state sport. Um, and um, when I was when I was 18 years old, my family moved in mass down to Southwest Washington, and so I moved into a pl part of the country that I didn't know at all. It rained for three weeks, I think, the day I landed here. Um, and so I was sort of depressed and had no 
roots. I had no um, idea about what I was going to do. And so I decided I was going to go to school. And I signed up for a community college in southwest Washington. And at about the same time, I got a job at a, um, at a retail company. And the people that I gravitated toward when I was at school, they all drank. And the people that I gravitated to at my work, they all drank. And so this solemn vow that I had taken as a, as a kid was just thrown out the window. It's like, okay, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to hang out with these people and we're going to drink. Now, mind you, I'm 19 years old. I'm not legal to go into bars, but I went into bars with my friends anyway. And no one ever carded me because I was with this big group of people. You know, and I remember really pissing off the bar trend. Oops, sorry. Oh, my gosh. Um, I remember really irritating the bartender um, when I came in at, on, my, on my 21st birthday and showed him my ID, which was a real sweet thing to do. You know, I basically I had threatened his his livelihood without him knowing it for two years. But in any case, um, the, these two separate groups um, really um, helped me develop my alcoholism. Um, I remember there was a, you know, we would have, this was in the 80s, we would have these um, kegger parties, usually in someone's garage, you know, and everybody would mill around and drink and have a good time. And and I was, I, I, I think I was staggering around outside looking at a bush, you know, I don't know what I was doing exactly, but um, my, this guy I worked with came up to me and he was one of those sort of charismatic, vibrant kind of people. He was a whitewater kayaker and all the girls loved him. And I really looked up to him. I admired him and I wanted him to approve of me. And he comes up to me and he goes, Hey kid, I really like you cause you can hold your beer. And I felt this just warmth <laughs> wash through me. It's like acceptance, you know, I'm being accepted for what I do. And um, I sort of threw myself into that. And I got um, to the point where, you know, I was drinking all the time. I mean, parties would end and I'd be the last one sort of shuffling out. Um, and it was, you know, for a short, short period of time, it was fun. I had a blast. And then... Um, the people that I worked with who all drank like I did, so I sort of fit in with this big crowd, they either were getting fired or they were quitting or they were, you know, doing whatever and they were disappearing. And so the herd kept getting smaller and smaller. And whereas I fit into this big crowd and was not very identifiable, I started to get identifiable because I was, my drinking wasn't changing and the um, environment was getting um, sort of scarce. Um, throw into that, you know, I know we're we're focused on um, on alcoholism here, and and that is why I'm here. Um, but I I also did um, some um, then and now illegal drugs, and that may be a shock to you, but it was the '80s, um, and it was almost like sort of that's what you do. And um, I got into those pretty heavily. And um, my life started to really, really spiral when I added the, the drugs to the alcohol. Um, when I was, I just turned 21. Um, I was one month this side of 21. And um, I was trying to put the moves on some girl at a bar. And I remember her disappearing about halfway through the scene, you know, she was gone. I don't, but I was still there drinking. And uh, they came over and they said, it's closing time. And I said, okay. And I slammed down whatever I had. And then I, I drove two blocks to the bar down the street, which I knew had a slower clock. And <laughs> I ordered a couple of doubles and I slammed down a couple of doubles. And then they said, well, we're closing too. And then I got in my car, and I, at that point, I had a 15-mile uh, drive home um, from Portland to Battleground, Washington. 
and I crossed the interstate bridge from Oregon into Washington. And as soon as I crossed the bridge, I saw lights <laughs> and I, I got pulled over and the guy comes up to me and he says, um, do you know why I've pulled you over? I said, I think I do. And he says, can I see your license and registration? And my registration is in my glove box. And I remember falling over um, on my side, looking for the, um, the registration. And I finally, I think I found it. And I hand it to him, and he says, can you step out of the car? And I go, okay. You know, so I'm staggering around. And he says, can you recite to me the alphabet and touch your fingers at the same time? Which I can't do today. <laughs> um, and and he starts asking me these, you know, doing the field sobriety test. And I just said, look, I, I'm drunk. Just take me in. And he goes, okay. <laughs> and he sticks me in the back. He doesn't even handcuff me. I mean, I'm I'm that compliant. I'm just sort of like, <laughs> you know, he just throws me in there. And, uh, you know, I get booked and um, thrown into jail. And I think my mailman was in there. Um, <laughs> and... We, you know, I made best friends with all the guys in the drunk tank, and and I had to call my mom at three in the morning um, to come pick me up, which is really, really, you know, uh, sort of humiliating. And my mom came and she said, "Never, don't ever, ever do this to me again." And um, you know, I said, "Okay, fine." Um, and you know how I was feeling as as time started to go on. Um, I felt really out of control. You know, I didn't know exactly what was going on inside of me. I just knew that I didn't like who I was. Um, and I would look at, I would wake up and I would look at myself in the mirror and I'd say, I, you know, I, I really, I'd think, who are you? And then I would say, I can't do this anymore. And then I would do it again. And that cycle of um, self-loathing, and repeated humiliation and self-loathing just started to go on and on and on. Um, you know, I, I, I can remember now, as I look back on it, as I actually tried to stop drinking a couple times, which is weird. Um, one time I decided that, you know how you get those thoughts? You know, I did the self-help books too. The problem with self-help books is they actually act, ask you to do things, which I was unwilling to do. Um, but you know, you get those, those wild hair thoughts in your head. It's like today I'm going to quit, you know, and I had one of those thoughts one day, but I unfortunately just bought a bottle of tequila. <laughs> and I mean, how can you quit when you've just bought a bottle of tequila? <laughs> you know, there's, there, we don't, we can't throw anything away. So I came up with the plan, which was, um, I was going to create a time capsule for myself. And so I wrapped the tequila in um, saran wrap and then wrapped that in aluminum foil. And then I went out to my parents' house in Battleground, which had this huge oak tree, and marched off 10 paces to the north and five paces to the west and dug a hole and buried the bottle <laughs> with the clear intent in my head that I would come back to this bottle 20 years, let's say, <laughs> in the future, and unearth this fine aged tequila. Um, that was the best thought in my head on how to stop drinking. Two days later, I'm out there with a shovel, carefully poking around the dirt, trying to make sure I don't break the bottle. And that's as good as I could do. Um, the other time that I can clearly remember, uh, my grandparents were having a, uh, a 60th wedding anniversary in Okeen, Oklahoma. And in, my, and, and in my clear, rational brain, I thought to myself, they don't drink in Oklahoma. They have dry counties in Oklahoma. I knew that that was true. They do have dry counties in Oklahoma. Okeen is not in one of them. <laughs> um, but I, my parents really wanted me to go. I couldn't afford it, but so they flew me out to Oklahoma. And here I am in a really small town in Oklahoma with my family. You know, and when I was drinking back in Vancouver, which is where I lived, um, my family didn't see me much. 
I lived in my world and I kept separate from my family because I did not want them to see how I drank. And here I was in this small town with my family and there's no way I can drink. So, you know, my sister comes into town with a rental car and that was, I was saved. <laughs> and uh, you know, so we drove, we drive out of town and we go, we go drink in some other place. That sister, by the way, has 10 months right now, which I'm really excited about. Um, and so I started drinking and, um, and then I found myself in a bar with my dad drinking. I mean, which was like, it may sound weird, but to me, that was almost the lowest I could ever get. It's like I had, I had such emotional energy charged around that environment. And here I was breaking every principle that I had ever held just so I could drink. And when I got picked up at the airport by my drug dealer, I was back and running. And then it got bad. And um, one day, and I can't tell you why this happened, and this is the one of the miracles of, of how um, this program works. Um, I had started to see these commercials on TV about uh, 10 days and a couple of two-day follow-ups, and we can fix you. you know. So I got it into my head that I could go into a hospital and they would fix me of my problem. And um, the other thought that crossed my mind, which I don't know where it came from, was if not now, when? You know, if I'm going to stop, when am I going to do it? If not now, when? And I walked into my work one day, and I walked up to my boss, and I don't know where these words came from. And I walked up to her, and I said, I have a problem, and I need help. And she said, I know. And um, so I went and looked for treatment centers. That was my solution was I was going to be hospitalized because a, a clear scientific method would be used to cure me of this problem that I had. And so, um, but the hospital, the bed wasn't available for like, you know, a week or something. So I continued on my life, sort of jittering, waiting to get into this place. I remember going to my drug dealer before I went into the hospital on my, my last weekend of drinking and, and using things. And I remember going up to him. And I, oddly enough, he was a friend. Um, and I said, I, you know, I need to buy this. And um, he said, well, I thought you were going into treatment. And I said, I am. He says, well, why are you here? And this is my drug dealer. <laughs> and he says, and I, and I said, I don't know. And that was the most honest thing I could tell him. I don't know why I'm here, but I am. Please give me what I asked for. Um, three days after that or so, um, I walked into the treatment center, and um, I was horrified and relieved at the same time because I'd finally taken a positive step towards changing my life. Up till that point, I had been waiting for my life to change, and it just hadn't done it. And I went into this hospital, and they were gracious enough to tell me that they couldn't fix me. They said that we have a, um, we're going to give you a break, and we're going to introduce you to some people who can help, but we can't fix you. And I'm going, great, okay. And then I saw the word God on the wall, and I was like, oh, great. You know, now what have I gotten myself into? And then they did an intake. They did, did a, a, a an intake of you know my qualifications to be there, and I had told them only of the drug abuse, and so they asked me a bunch of questions about my drug abuse, and I answered them. I was sort of whipped, so I answered them honestly. And the guy says, "Well, yeah, based on your answers, you're a you're a drug addict." Which was a relief. I mean, just sort of acknowledgement of, of what I already knew. And he said, well, what about your drinking? And I said, I don't have a problem with drinking. <laughs> and these are his words. He says, well, humor me. And, and he reaches over and he pulls out this. Um, I remember it clearly. He opens a drawer and he pulls out this questionnaire and he sits it down and he starts asking me questions. And I start lying. 
You know, I don't know if I was lying just automatically or I was trying to make myself look better. I don't know why. I lied through the whole thing. And at the end of it, he says, well, based on your answers, you're a chronic alcoholic. <laughs> Who knows what he would have told me if I had actually told him the truth. Um, but that was, you know, we talk in this program about moments of clarity. And that was a moment of clarity for me. That was like, huh. You know, and a realization that every time I did anything bad in my life, including drugs, relationships, whatever, I drank first. And so what I realized, um, not necessarily right in that moment, but fairly quickly, was that um, alcohol was my primary problem. Everything else was window dressing. And that I needed to focus on this issue um, or all those other issues were, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I couldn't deal with it all at once. So I just focused on one. Um, the interesting thing that I, I, I think about uh, coming to AA is that um, when I got to a point where I was willing to do anything to stop drinking, I admitted that I had a problem. I asked for help. And I, and I knew that I couldn't be the one that, that, cr that created the solution. So I did steps one, two, and three before I got to AA. And then I got to AA, and the first thing I started to do was argue with you about everything, and especially about God, because I was not, that was not in the cards for me. That was not going to be my path. And I got the best advice I've ever received, maybe, in AA. This woman looked at me, and she said, it doesn't matter what you believe, it matters what you do. She said, so act as if you believe in a God and see how, see how you see if it works. And so I did that without belief in anything. I prayed and um, I started to see coincidences in my life that I to this day can't explain. Um, you know, just just I mean, I, I'm not even going to go into them. I mean, just just the, the world around me sort of snapped into clarity for the first time. And I started to see things that I'd never seen before. And they were, had always been there, but I'd just, I'd obliterated them with drugs and alcohol. So my early days in AA were um, blissful, um, mainly because all I did was go to meetings and go to fellowship after meetings and eat pie and, and, uh, and uh, I became a coffee maker fairly quickly, so I had a service position. I didn't even drink coffee. Um, you know, I got, I had been an isolator my entire life, and suddenly I was with a group of people who wanted me there, which was a shock to the system. And I was like a, you know, I was like a person who's been in the desert for days and is thirsty. And I suddenly was just drinking up this fellowship that we have here and it was intoxicating so to speak and it was it was amazing and it, and it was exactly what i needed um i did struggle at first with the number of meetings i went to until in my aftercare my buddy mike um he was going to like eight or nine meetings a week and i was going to one or zero and um i got sort of called on it and i didn't like that so I started going to more meetings with what I now call competitive sobriety, <laughs> which was, he's not going to get ahead of me. And uh, Mike and I are still sober today. Um, we're about three days apart, so I think that's really cool. But um, I found a sponsor who was exactly what I wanted, which was he was very hands-off. He didn't insist on anything. I remember doing the third step prayer with him, you know, this this older man asking me to get down on my knees in his living room and hold his hand. And I'm going, okay. And then we read the third step prayer out of the book, and I'm like, okay. And he's and he's thinking, This is great. You've done the third step, let's let's keep going. And I'm like, I don't know what that means, you know, and, and he was, he didn't push me. 
I don't ever remember him saying, you need to do a fourth step. He probably did, but I don't remember it. And so I really threw myself into this fellowship and I did, you know, I got service positions. I ran dances and I went to conventions and I did all kinds of stuff around the edges. And there were these people in the meetings that absolutely terrified me. The big book thumpers, you know, they had this sort of old timey revival kind of a feel to them that I pushed back on. And, um, but my life got better. I will say my life got a lot better. Um, and at about three years sober, I, my company that I had still worked for through this entire time, they finally promoted me to the next level up. They, they promoted me to be an assistant manager of a store in Anchorage, Alaska, which oddly enough is where I grew up. Um, so that was a very strange thing. So at three years sober, I moved to Anchorage in December of 1989, and it's pitch black and it's cold, and I'm like, eh, home. You know, it's it's just the way things are. And I start going to meetings up there, and it's not quite the same. Because these people hadn't watched me come in the door, and they didn't know my story, and they didn't know... You know, how funny I was and, you know, how good of a guy I was. And I was just some guy sitting in the back. And I wasn't a visitor and I wasn't a newcomer. And I started to shrivel and die in AA. And I can remember, this This will give you an idea of the, of the magnitude of my ego. Um, I remember saying at one point, don't you people know who I am? And some voice in the back, no, we don't. <laughs> and I was dying. And we were at work, we were doing an inventory, which is odd. And um, I came out to my, I, I, I came to my Wednesday night meeting. I finally got a new sponsor. I came to my Wednesday night meeting and the topic was the fourth step. And I am vibrating as I'm sitting there because um I realized that up till this point, all I've ever shared in a meeting about the fourth step and the fifth and sixth and on was my theories about it. I had no practical experience. And we got it. We go around this circle and everybody's sharing about their experience and I am just freaking out. And this last guy next to me, he shares and he's looking at me. He's looking me right in the eye as he's sharing about his experience with the fourth step. And I'm really, really terrified. And the um, it's it ends, and the, the meeting ends without me having to share. And I'm like relieved and horrified at the same time. And I go up to this man who I'd never seen before, and I said, "It looked like you were you were talking directly at me." And he said, "I was." And I said, "Why?" And he goes, "Because you looked really scared." <laughs> and, and my sponsor had wandered his way up there about that time. And I, and I was talking to this guy, and I said, you know, I've never, ever really, I've never done a fourth step. Aside from the one that I did in treatment, which was, you know, meaningless. Um, and my sponsor just smiled, and he says, that's okay. He says, tomorrow at 5 o'clock, I'll listen to your fifth step. And this is Wednesday night <laughs> at 8 o'clock at night. So I went home, and I wrote. And um, as a friend of mine um, points out, he's, you know, this is my experience. My fourth step took four years and two hours to write. You know, I drug my feet for um, four years, and then in two hours I got it done. Because that was my third step. That moment when my sponsor said, tomorrow I'll do your fifth step, that was the moment that I had been looking for on my knees with my sponsor, and it wasn't there. I had to be willing to do anything to change because I had been coming to meetings waiting for you guys to change me. And you weren't doing it. I mean, you were friendly, but you weren't doing it for me. And I've, I've sponsored guys since, and they've come up to me and they said, you know, this isn't working out so well with you because I'm looking for somebody who's, who's going to be more directive. And I look at them and I say, so what you're really telling me is that you want someone to run your life for you. And that's an uncomfortable thing to say, but it's true. 
I want you guys to do all the work and I want to get all the benefits. That's just how I'm built. And what I've found in being around here a long time is that, um, A, I'm incredibly self-centered and B, I'm incredibly lazy. And that's a bad combination for a drunk. <laughs> um, lazy and self-centered means that I'm only after what I want and I'm not willing to do any effort to change that. So AA teaches us through service and fellowship and working the steps um, to shift that a little bit, to change it. You know, what's the, you know, the, the, the 12th step? What is the, what's the goal there? I mean, what it says that, you know, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we carry this message to al other alcoholics and then practice these principles in all our affairs. So I read that as your life having your life having changed. Now go help people. And don't be uh, a bad person <laughs> is, is my interpretation of the 12th step. You know, you, you help people and don't be bad, um, which is simplistic, but it's sort of true. And that is that takes effort. It takes effort to be willing to answer the phone at three in the morning. And it takes effort to... Um, Say, I'm, I volunteer to help clean up after the meeting. And it takes effort to say, yes, when a, when a man comes up to you and says, would you be my sponsor? No matter how many people I'm working with, I never say no. And that's because my sponsor um, has taught me that. And his theory on it, which I don't necessarily believe wholly, but he believes that time is not relative when it comes to AA. He believes that no matter how many people you're working with, you'll always have enough time. And darn it, he's right. Um, I always have enough time. So um, my life today, you know, I'm still an isolator. <laughs> I don't necessarily hide in a 10 by 10 box anymore. I do still read a lot. Um, but AA has become the... Um, the center of my life, in a sense. Um, you know, the family that I avoided as a child, you've become. Um, I've traveled all over the world and gone to AA meetings in a bunch of different countries, a bunch of different languages. Um, it's all the same. It's incredible. You know, I've been um, I've been truly blessed, and and even when I'm blessed, I still want more you know i've got an ego it's not my best friend but i've got it and uh you know this process has has changed me and and i'm more willing to do things that um aren't necessarily fun or comfortable but they're necessary um as a result of being a member of this program i didn't get to the cake story i was hoping to get to the cake story because my friend Jerry's back there. Okay, I'll quick, quickly do the cake story. So um, this is an amends story, real quick. I was uh, My brother was coming up on his 50th birthday. My brother was born on October 11th. I was born on October 10th. As a result, as a child, we always shared our birthday. <laughs> Resentment, number one. Um, I clearly remember being resentful because my mom made a cake for our birthday where my brother got this, she cut this cake into the shape of a sailboat and he got the sailboat. And then there was a little sun in the sky and I got the sun in the sky. I, I want half, you know, he's five years older than me. He, you know, he gets the big cake and everything. And my, my sisters, the same ones that showed me the, the um, old um, album, they showed me a picture it's Alan's third birthday, and there it is, the cake. And I, so my, my first resentment was when I was three years old. <laughs> and I remembered it. And um, so fast forward, my brother's turning 50. I bring up this resentment to my friend Jerry. He gives me the greatest, some of the greatest advice. He says, well, why don't you recreate the cake? The cake? So I buy a sheet cake. I make 
a replica of best of my ability of what my mom did in 1963. And I take it to my brother's birthday in Portland. And his wife looks at me and goes, I'm so grateful I didn't get a cake. <laughs> and, and I bring it in and my brother, he knows exactly what it is. He goes, you, he says, you made the cake. And I said, yeah. And he goes, do you want to be the sailboat this time? And I said, no, the sun's just fine. Yeah, stop. Um, I, I guess my point is, is that um, for me, amends are, I can never change what happened in the past, but I can change how I view it. And that's a gift of this program. So I think I'm done. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.